Good morning and welcome to Park Church. We're glad that you're here with us. We are continuing this morning on our series called You Do Who You Are. And the basis of this series is uh, that God has, God has made us who we are. And if we can learn who God has made us to be, uh, really living is quite simple. All we have to do is we have to do who we are. We have to do who God has made us to be. And so over the last few weeks, we've talked about how God has made us his children, and we can live like it. And in the future, we're going to talk about how God has made us his servants, and God has also made us family. And by that, we mean brothers and sisters with one another. Uh, This morning, though, we're going to focus on this one. It's that God has made us his missionaries. So we're invited to live like it. Now, if I were to ask you, what do you think of when you think of a missionary? I imagine your mind might go, to a, might go to a bunch of different places. For me, and I bet for a lot of us, it goes to like people who get on a plane and go from this place to another place, right? Um, and they tell people about Jesus in that place. People who go, you know, halfway across the world, probably to like poor, underdeveloped countries where people don't know about Jesus in order to share Jesus with them. And so you think about... Um, Places like, you know, Azerbaijan and places in, you know, the Sudan and wherever else that missionaries that you hear about missionaries going to share Jesus. Um, For some of you, you might think of Mother Teresa, right? That's sort of like the missionary image that we have. Um, This, you know, nun who goes to India, goes to Calcutta, serves the poor orphanages, tells people about Jesus, all of that. And if that's what you think of as um, a missionary, then you're right. That's that's what a missionary is. That's what a missionary is. Now, the thing you might be thinking is, well, if that's what a missionary and if, is, and that's, if that's what God has made me to be, well, I can't do that. Because I have like a job, and I have like a home and a mortgage, right? And like a, I have a wife or a husband, and I have like a family to take care of, and I can't do that, and I don't really like mosquito nets, and so that's not on the table for me. Um, And sure, that version of being a missionary is not for everyone. Um, The thing is, it is for some of us, and it might be for you. And if that's something that God might be calling you to do, that form of a missionary, you should follow that call and you should listen to that. The impulse to send missionaries out like this around the world, this is not something that we dreamed up in the church um, to make ourselves look good or feel good or to like spread what we have. Um, This is something that really comes from Jesus himself. When Jesus was doing his work, his his teaching, his healing and whatnot, what he would do is he would go into an area and then um, he couldn't get to everywhere. So he would send out his followers, either one by one or two by two, into the surrounding areas and tell them to tell people that the kingdom of God had come, that Jesus was here, God was visiting them. And he he did that, and they did that repeatedly. Um, After he died and was raised from the dead, Really, the first thing he did with his followers, his disciples, is he gathered them and says, look, guys, here's what you are going to do. You are going to go and you are going to make disciples. Because what it means to be a disciple is to be someone who goes and makes more disciples. You are going to go and be missionaries. You're going to teach people to obey all that I've commanded. You're going to baptize in my name. You're going to introduce people to who I am. um, And you're going to do it. You're going to do it uh, everywhere right? Um, Go and make disciples, he said, of all nations, which means everywhere. He also said to them, uh, same kind of time, he said to them, here's another way to think about it, you will be my witnesses. A witness is someone who has seen something and then can tell others about it. In this case, a witness is someone who knows Jesus, who has seen Jesus, who has seen what Jesus can do, and is then in a position to go and tell other people about it. And after his death and resurrection, he gathered his followers, his disciples, and said, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. That was the city that they were in right there, uh, which means you will be my witnesses where you are. He said, you will be my witnesses in Judea and Samaria. And that's the area just outside of Jerusalem. So you will be witnesses outside of where you are. And then he said, you will also be my witnesses to the ends of the earth. And the ends of the earth means the ends of the earth. And for some of them, they were called and sent to go, to go all the way to the end of the earth. From the very beginning, from Jesus himself, the Christian faith, following Jesus is a missionary faith. That's, that's the direction. It goes out. Um, not so that we could dominate or colonize people, and this, this, this whole missionary idea has been used um, 
in the wrong ways, and it's done a lot of bad over the years. But uh, this was something that came from Jesus himself, because if, if Jesus is true, if Jesus is universally true, then the universe needs to know about him, right? If Jesus is true, everyone needs to know about him. And also, if Jesus is good, if the message that we bring, if Jesus is good, then the world needs to know. If it's true for everyone and if it's good for everyone, then uh, we should find a way to go and share it. And that's, that's really the missionary impulse that began Christianity. And so in a very real sense, we are all missionaries. To be a Jesus follower is to be a missionary. But here's the thing. You don't need to go to Asia or to Africa or uh, anywhere else to be a missionary. You are meant to be a missionary in the very place that you live. Because the place that you live, that we live, more and more is filled with people who are less and less Christians, less and less Jesus followers. In fact, we live in a, in a culture that people are calling a post-Christian culture. Um, back in the day, maybe 50 years ago, this was a Christian culture. And by that, I don't mean everyone was a Christian, but I mean the ideals behind Christianity um, were just taken for granted, right? The Bible was the Bible. If, you were to, if this were to be 50 years ago, we wouldn't be here 50 years ago, but if I were to be in another church building 50 years ago, um, or even meeting someone on the street, and I said to them, the Bible says this, the Bible says that, God says this, God says that, it would have carried an entirely different weight in that day. People would have accepted the, um, the authority, the teaching of the Bible, because it was the Bible. We lived in a Christian culture. Today, we live in a not-Christian culture. We live in a post-Christian culture. Now, note, it's not anti-Christian. It's not against Christianity. It's just not really Christian any longer. Um, for most people in the world that we live in, um, they grew up in a sort of Christian background. They maybe went to church, um, maybe were involved with Sunday school or CCD. They know the basics of it. And it's not that they're against those things. Some of them are, and with good reason, but it's not that they're against those things. It's just that they didn't see the relevancy of those things for life, or um, the way that God, the way that faith was taught to them wasn't super compelling, and so they've just moved on from it, and they've moved on with life without Christianity. So they're not anti-Christian. They're not Christian in any real sense, but they're post-Christian. Um, studies kind of indicate that about 50% of, American, of Americans, of American culture, is just post-Christian. Um, included in that might be people who think of themselves as Christian. They might believe in God, that sort of thing. They might think the Bible has some good ideas in it, but in no real way would they, would they um, consider themselves or think of themselves as uh, Christian. And in a post-Christian post world, in a post-Christian culture, um, it's a different way of sharing faith because people aren't against, people aren't against it. And um, post-Christian people will come to churches for weddings or have their weddings in churches. Or when they have babies or when they have funerals, they'll expect to go to um, churches for funerals and for weddings and for babies and all that sort of stuff. Um, they might even pay homage to Jesus in like liking memes on Facebook that talk about this. Um, but it's no longer who, it's no longer who people are. It's more than half of us. It's more than half of the people who we're surrounded with and we live with every day. There's a good chance it, um, it could even be you right now. I mean, that, I could be describing you. There's a really good chance I'm describing what your son will be or what your daughter will be as they grow up um, or who your neighbor is or who the people who you work with are. The point is, in this culture, which is no longer Christian, it's more post-Christian, the point is you don't need to go halfway across the world to be a missionary. You might just need to go across the street. The mission field is right here. For those of us who are Jesus followers, do you think of yourself like this? Do you think of yourself as a missionary? When you think about your role in society, whether it's as a mom or a dad or as a brother or sister or as a neighbor or as a coworker or as a teacher or as a friend or whatever it is, do you think of yourself as, I am this, 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 I'm also a missionary in this place? You should. 
because it's what God has made you. It's what God wants for you and from you. And we're going to look at a central, central passage in the New Testament that really kind of opens up this idea for us. It's from a guy named Paul, who most certainly was a missionary. After Jesus met him, he converted, and for about 10 years, he learned what the faith was all about, and then he became a missionary, the kind of missionary who went to other places and taught people about Jesus. What he did was he traveled all around the eastern Mediterranean from like Jerusalem and Judea and up through Syria and Turkey and Greece and Rome and Italy and whatnot. Um, his goal was to go all the way to Spain, right? Um, what he would do is he would travel around the Mediterranean and he would tell people about Jesus. His goal was to gather these people together into what he called a church. A church is not a building. You're not in a church. You're amongst the church. Um, he would gather people and call them churches, and what he wanted for them was for them to know Jesus so that they could go and share Jesus with the world around. What Paul tried to do was set up churches as missionary outposts. So he would go to an area, uh, establish that church, and then the idea was that that church would then reach out to their area. And he would be with them for months, maybe a year, maybe even longer than that, and then he would move on to the next place. And what he would do in between is he would write letters back and forth to these churches, sometimes to correct them, sometimes to teach them, sometimes to encourage them. Um, and his letters, basically, which are missionary letters, his letters are what we have and make up a substantial part of our New Testament. And so when Paul uh, writes to the Corinthian church, uh, that's what we're going to look at, the second letter to the Corinthians, what he's doing is um, he's speaking about his own role, his own kind of um, being a missionary, and he does that to encourage the Corinthians to be like him, um, to kind of think of ourselves and see, our, see ourselves in the same way that Paul thinks of himself and sees us. So this is what he writes. It's in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, starting with verse 19. Paul writes, <clears throat> In Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. He says, so we are ambassadors for Christ, since God is making his appeal through us. Paul describes himself and us not as missionaries. That word, I don't think that word even appears in the New Testament, but he describes himself by a different title, the title of ambassadors, since God is making his appeal through us. This is how Paul imagines himself. And this makes sense because this is what Jesus imagined for us, right? Go out and make disciples. You are my ambassadors in the world. Um, I'm going to make my appeal to all the nations. I'm going to make my appeal through you. And this is how we are called and invited to think of ourselves as ambassadors for Christ since God is making his appeal through us. If I could use a simpler um, way of putting this, we are God's strategy. We are God's strategy for reaching the world around us, the world that he has reconciled to himself, the world that he loves, the world that he has discounted their trespasses. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And the world that he wants for them to come to know him, to give him life. That's what God wants. We are God's strategy. And to put a finer point on it, you are the strategy. You are the strategy. Do you think of yourself as God's strategy. If it's true that we are, we ought to know a little more about what Paul means by this. So we're going to dig into this imagery and this language a little bit. What, is, um, what does Paul mean by ambassador? What is an ambassador? An ambassador is basically the same today as it was then, right? Someone who goes from one place to another place to give a message to do some work. Um, I, I was writing this part of the message earlier this week where um, the news came out that those three North Korean or American prisoners were freed from North Korea, and it was because Mike Pompeo went over there a few weeks ago. Um, I was at a party last night, and I was talking about Mike Pompeo, and it was clear the person had no idea who, who Mike Pompeo was. So it's not an assumed thing that people know who Mike Pompeo is. He was our CIA director, and then he became our Secretary of State. So just a little, you know, poli sci for you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so he went over there to, I, I don't really know what he was trying to do. Um, he was trying to like avert war, I think. But in the process, um, he was trying to get these free American, that these three Americans freed 
from prison. Um, he's not an official ambassador, but he was functioning like an ambassador. He had the authority and the, the, um, the negotiating power of our government to go over there and to uh, talk with that government. That's what, that's what ambassadors do. In those days, it was the same. Um, a king or an emperor would send an ambassador from one place to another to, to what? To negotiate peace, to negotiate trade, um, to start war, to end war, uh, to give a message, whatever it is. Except in those days, the role of an ambassador was just that much more important. Because, you know, now you can pick up a phone, you could email, uh, you could Snapchat at the leader who you're looking to talk to. Um, in those days, if you wanted to have a complicated, like, treaty negotiation, the only way to do it was to go yourself, which was impossible for kings and emperors to do, or you had to, like, write letters and stuff like that. And you could imagine how long it would take for, like, complex communication to go back and forth with a letter with, you know, a guy running or a guy riding a horse or a chariot or whatever. Um, it would be impossible. So what they would do is they would, you know, give all of the authority, the negotiating power, all of that to an ambassador to go and do the work of the king and the emperor for them. And that was, that was the role of the ambassador. It was... Um, it was a great weight of responsibility and authority and power. They gave the role of ambassadors in that day to people who were very well like, liked and trusted, who were probably powerful men and women. That was the role of the ambassador. Paul tells these Corinthians, just like he tells us today, um, that's what we are. We are ambassadors sent, sent, sent on a mission into this land that we're in, um, sent on a mission. And the mission really is to relay the message of reconciliation that's been entrusted to us. That's essentially what we're called to do, to go and share the message that's been entrusted to us. Now, within this, there's a bunch of things that, we just, that, that Paul takes for granted that I want to kind of point out to us. The first thing is that an ambassador is sent from one place to another place, from one people to another people, right? If an ambassador stays at home, they're not a good ambassador. If an ambassador goes and stays in the hotel room, not a good ambassador. If an ambassador goes and only talks to the people who were from his crew that goes with him, not a good ambassador. Um, if an ambassador keeps to himself, He's not actually being an ambassador. An ambassador is sent to go and engage, encounter the people who he's sent to go uh, and do the mission with. Like I said, in this post-Christian world, you don't need to be sent very far to be an ambassador. It could be as far as your kitchen table, or it could be as far as your lunch table, or it could be as far as the conference table. But as missionaries, we are sent, and so keeping to ourselves is not an option. This, though, keeping to ourselves, this is a temptation that Christians are really um, likely to do, to keep to ourselves. Because we're told again and again and again, love one another, love one another, uh, encourage, care for one another. And that's all good, and we do that. But sometimes we do it at the expense of doing it for anyone who's not one of these one another's, and the other one another's who are out there. And we come to places like this, and we enjoy faith, and we enjoy learning about faith, and we enjoy being part of this Christian community, and the friendships that form here are great, and they're wonderful, um, and we love being part of a community like this. But what happens is that we forget that this community actually exists for the people who are not yet in it. And so we keep, we keep to ourselves. For some of you, um, this is not a problem at all. You are, you are meaningfully engaging with the people who you work with. Um, you're coaching your kids' soccer teams, and you're engaging with those parents like that. Um, you are out there giving of yourself for the world around. For some of you, not a problem. For others of us, it's a huge problem. We don't communicate, contact with people outside of the church, and it's a big problem. This understanding of being an ambassador takes for granted that we are sent to people who don't know Jesus. And so I'll ask you, how is that going? Are you in the lives of people who, who, who don't know Jesus? Are you investing in the lives of people who are, who are not part of this church or part of any church? 
Are you sacrificing for them? Are you giving of yourself for them? Being a missionary, being an ambassador sends us out to do a job. And so keeping to ourselves is just a dereliction of our duties. And this matters because you, you are the strategy. That's the first thing that this understanding kind of takes for granted. The second thing is that the ambassador has a grasp on what he's doing, on what she's doing, on what the mission is. When Mike Pompeo goes to North Korea, he knows what he's there for. He's not there to get fashion chips from King Jong Un. Uh, he's not there. He's not there to talk about you know trade. He's there to help with the North and the South peace thing. He's here to. He's there to get the prisoners out. He's there to prepare the way for the thing that Trump and King Jong Un are going to do in a few weeks. Like he knows what he's there for, and he goes to do it. For us, our mission is to relay the message. It's to get to know the message of the king so that we can get it across to those who don't know it. Um, next week, we're going to focus really on what this looks like practically. But this week, I just want to say, um, to be able to relay the message, however we're to do that, to be able to relay it, it's important as part of this mission that we know something of the message, that we know it for ourselves, that we know it so that we could communicate it if it was asked of us. And what is the message? I mean, there's a lot of different ways to put it. Paul puts it right up there in verse 19 for us. Um, the message is that in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. Paul is saying the world needed reconciling because of what, what's called trespasses. Trespasses are the things that we shouldn't do um, that we've done anyway. Trespasses are the, like, God has put a border around our lives, a boundary around our lives, and we stepped over that boundary, and we shouldn't have done those things. Trespasses are the things that have hurt other people, that have hurt ourselves, that have hurt our relationship with God. Trespasses are the things that we do to walk away from what God has made us, to turn our backs on God, to cause other people to turn their backs on God. Um, the writers of the Bible call this, again and again, they call this sin, and these trespasses, these sins, have caused a rift between us and God. It's like broken the relationship between God on one hand and humans on the other. And what Paul says in this is that everything necessary to heal that rift, to repair that relationship, to do away with that brokenness, everything necessary God has done for the world in Christ. That's what God did when Jesus came. And um, the very next line of this kind of describes it. Um, on the cross, what happened was that Jesus himself took on all of our trespasses, all of our sin. And he took it on himself so that the sin that once belonged to you, once belonged to the world out there, no longer belongs out there, no longer belongs to you, but it belongs to Jesus. And on the cross, he became sin, Paul says, and on that cross, right there, Christ died. And he died the death that we ought to die because of our trespasses. He died the death that um, is the result of the brokenness between us and God. But in his body also, right there on the cross, he took all of our sins, the sins of the world, and he put them to death. And when he was buried in the tomb like that on that Friday evening, um, our, sin, our sin was buried there too. And he has made us clean because of that. So when Paul talks about forgiveness, that's what he's talking about. Paul is saying that those sins, those trespasses that are yours, that they, they should be yours, they're no longer yours, so God's not going to hold it against you. God's not going to hold it against them. And he has done this once and for all. And so the relationship, the life with God that we were made for, which was previously impossible, because of our trespasses, has now been turned into an invitation. And our mission is simply to go out and extend that invitation, to, to give that message and to extend that invitation, that nothing separates us from God, except for what we want to separate us, except for what we allow to separate us. The message is to relay that message, and you are the strategy to do it. Do you think of yourself as the strategy to relay that message? 
When you think of your life, what you do with your time and your energy and with your relationships and with your work, do you think of yourself uh, in those terms? Relaying this message, relaying this invitation. And the thing about it is, it's a good message to go with. It's a good message to have. Um, it's good news for us. It's good news for you. Maybe it's hard to believe sometimes that God would actually do this, that God would actually love us, that God would actually love me so much as to send his son into the world to take on the consequences of my sin, our sin. Um, but he did that. And you might be thinking, though, but you don't know what I've done. But God does know what you did. And God did it anyway. And you shouldn't do it anymore, but he promises he's not going to hold it against you. You are exactly the kind of person who God sent his son for. Uh, in the welcome and announcements, Paul referenced the year of the Bible thing that we've been doing. This week, we've read through the beginning of Romans. In Romans 5, which if you want to know the message, just read Romans 5. Um, Paul, Paul gives it to us. He says that at the right time, God sent Jesus into the world to die for the ungodly. Not to die for people who have it figured out. Not to die for people who have all the right answers or who are behaving the right way or believing the right way. But for people who aren't, who are ungodly. And ungodly people are people who do not believe the right things and who are walking away, who are turning their back on God. Um, Paul says that God proves his love. He demonstrates his love for us in that while we were still sinners, as we were literally crossing the line and have crossed it into trespass land, that's when God sent Jesus to die for us, to give his life for us. That's when he demonstrates his love. It's good news for us. It's true for us. It's true for the world out there. But it's also really challenging news. It's challenging because it forces us to see and to think and to live differently. Because it means that if he died for everyone out there, it means that he died for people who we have a hard time believing God would actually die for, God would give his life for. Or really, maybe we could believe God would do that because God is so good, but we kind of just wish he didn't. Because you don't know my boss, right? And you don't know my ex-husband and my ex-wife. You don't know the kid who I have to teach or the parent of the kid I have to teach. You don't know my neighbor. You don't know my co but if it's true that in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, then they're just as much a part of that world as I am, and as you are, and as we are. And if we are ambassadors of that message, we must go into the world bearing that message, with that, that fact, that truth compelling us forward. Just a few lines earlier in this letter, Paul kind of makes this clear. He says, for the love of Christ urges us on. And I love that. The love of Christ urges us on. It's not the threat of Christ. It's not the fear of Christ. It's not his command that's harsh that urges us on. It's definitely not our goodness or our faith or our belief or our works that urges us on, but it's Christ's love. Christ's love in us, but more importantly, Christ's love that he has for the world. For those who we wish he kind of didn't have that love, um, that's, that's what urges us on. That's what ought to fuel us as we move forward. He says, because we are convinced that one, Jesus, has died for all, everyone, and therefore all have died. Meaning, all of the sin of the world, all of it, has been taken on Jesus, and he has died for all. And all means all, even the person who you wish it didn't mean all for. Paul continues, and he died for all so that those who live might live no longer for themselves, but for him who died and was raised for them. And by that he means those of us who have come to follow Jesus, who have come to um, like know and live the life that God has meant for us to live. We don't live for ourselves, we live outside of ourselves. We live for him who died and was raised for them. Paul says, from now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. Paul is saying, when we regard people from a human point of view, we see what we normally see. My boss is a jerk, right? I hate my ex-husband. Um, the girl annoys me. He cheated on his wife, and he's a horrible person. As ambassadors 
who know the good news of what God has done for those people, we must see through that lens rather than from our own human point of view. Because our boss is someone for whom Christ has died. Our ex-husband, our, our, our former friend who has stabbed us in the back, our neighbor who we can't stand, the girl who annoys us, these are people whom God sent Jesus into the world to die for because he loves them. That is what urges us on and compels us forward to bring the message. When you think about going into your relationships, going into your world like that, how is that going? Are you able to see others as those for whom Christ also has died? Same as for you. This is how ambassadors see people. This is how ambassadors for Christ think and reason and live. Next Sunday, we're going to focus on what this actually looks like, like practically on the ground as, as representatives of Christ in the world. That's what we're going to think about. But this is, where, this is where the role of an ambassador really gets challenging. And this is the third thing this, sort of, this understanding takes for granted. It's not simply enough to know the message. It's not simply enough to be sent. It's not simply enough to even relay the message. But we're also called to embody it. Um, to live like it, to see like it, to think like it, to talk like it, to live like it. As ambassadors, we're not just messengers, we're also representatives of the one who has sent us, which is Jesus himself. And we're going to come back to what that looks like next Sunday. But um, are you able to walk into that situation, into that relationship, into the thing that you're called to walk into next? And are you first and foremost, are you able to walk into that and see and say to yourself, I am an ambassador. I need to see people through the lens of God's love rather than from my own point of view. I need to love people through the lens of God's love rather than my own point of view. Because when you walk into life with this understanding of who you are um, and what you're to do because of who you are, you're able to walk into life differently. Whether it's into your kitchen table, your lunch table, the conference table, or whatever other table you sit at. As God's missionaries, it's what we're made for. But I'll tell you, it's hard. It's hard to think like that. It's hard to live like that. We had an experience here uh, over the last three weeks that really kind of brought this home for me. Um, a few, and it is stool time, a few Tuesdays ago, uh, a few Tuesdays ago, it was about 9.28 in the morning. And I remember that it was 9.28 in the morning because we have a meeting at 9.30 that I was um, preparing for. And it's a meeting that we do every 9.30 on Tuesday morning really to prepare for the message ahead. There's like a staff member and a few volunteers who I gather, and we basically brainstorm. We talk about um, what does the passage for the week mean, and what is God saying, and what are some ways to communicate it, and what are some, like, let's brainstorm to make this message as good as it can be. And so 9.30, a few Tuesdays ago, 9.28, we were set to um, have that meeting. I'm preparing for it. I'm in my office, and I, I hear kind of a commotion in the foyer over here. Um, it's kind of a commotion. One of our volunteers is, like, handling it. Um, but what it is is I can hear it's a young woman who is just, like, breaking down. No, she's broken down. Um, this is a woman who um, has kind of lost everything. She moved up here. It's a complicated story. Um, she has kind of like no money and she's kind of in a bad place. She actually is living in the hotel, which is like down the street. It's like back in the industrial park. You've probably never even been past it. Um, she was living with another woman and that woman was waiting for a check to come or to clear or something so they could pay the bills or something. Um, they got in a huge fight and, you know, long story short, she found her way here and she's in our foyer really like pouring herself out. She has broken tears, the whole deal. I'm listening uh, to sort of this commotion from my office. I'm listening um, and for me, it's like 930 at this point. Uh, those two little guys show up on my shoulders, right? Um, this guy over here, he's the good angel. He's saying, uh, this sounds bad. You need to go help this woman. You need to go help the situation. Like, you can help her. And I'm like, OK. Uh, this guy seems to be louder. This guy seems to be louder for me sometimes. Um, he's over here, and he's saying to himself, uh, now it's 931. And your meeting, your meeting is, is late already. 
Um, these people are giving up their time to help you put together a better sermon, so you can't waste their time like this. Um, you don't have time for her. Send her on her way. And by the way, people who come in asking for money, you have no idea if, if it's true, if the story is true. We can't verify it. We have no idea. I mean, maybe this person goes from church to church just asking for money. We don't know. We've never seen her before. Um, send her on her way. You don't have time for this. So this is going to make me look like a bad guy. And okay. Um, but I started to walk out of my office to send her on her way. Because I was like, we don't have time for this. And who knows if this woman's actually telling the truth. You know, I don't want to give her a bunch of money and then see it go to something bad, right? This is kind of the reasoning we do. So I'm walking out of the office um, to basically do that. And all of a sudden, the content of our 930 meeting hits me. That morning, we were uh, going to be talking about the message I gave a few weeks ago, which was from 1 John. And it was like, see how great a love the Father has for us that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. And all that morning, I was putting together an outline of all the great things I was going to say about God's love, right? How, how God loves us and how he, he's made us his children. Um, and remember, like, the walls thing? You've got to chip away at the walls. Um, that imagery actually came out of that meeting. That was not my idea. That was someone else's idea. Um, and how we have to rid ourselves. We have to rid ourselves of the unlove. And I was putting this outline together, and I was like, okay, this is going to actually come out to be pretty good. Um, and as I was preparing that morning, I came across a passage, 1 John 3, 17. Um, and I was like, this is going to be a great passage to read on that Sunday. I'm going to like hit people with this truth. They're going to be blown away by it. They're going to go out and love people totally differently. Uh, this is, this is going to be awesome. I am so clever for, for, for finding that passage that John wrote 2,000 years ago. So all that's in the back of my mind. I haven't thought about that. Um, I'm walking out of the office to send this woman on her way so that I can get to a meeting that I'm already late for to prepare to, 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 to teach you guys this. And John speaks to me. 2,000 years later, John speaks to me. 1 John 3.17, uh, it, it, this is what it says. It says, how can the love of God abide in anyone? How can the love of God be in anyone who sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses to help? And then John continues. He says, <laughs> he says, he says, little children. And now I know why he said that. <laughs> he said, kids, let us love not in word or in speech or in a Sunday sermon, but let us love in truth and in action. John. <laughs> I had forgotten, in that moment, what I am. I'm an ambassador for Christ. God is making his appeal through me. Now, it wouldn't have went south because the volunteer and the people, the staff who was there were already on top of this. They were on ambassador mode. But if I went out there, thank God John reminded me 2,000 years later, because if I went out there without that, forgetting that I'm an ambassador, the very first thing that this broken woman, who is clearly a post-Christian, she's been hurt by the church, she had left it behind, the first thing she would have encountered is some jerk pastor saying, no, you are not worth this $100 so you could stay in the hotel that night and not sleep in the car. You're not worth that. You're not worth that to us as God's people. Uh, and what that means is you're not worth that to God himself. That's what she would have heard uh, if John didn't remind me. I needed that morning to have my mind changed about who I am and who I ought to be and who God calls me to be. Thank God John reminded me that day. For you, make that mind shift. Change your mind so that you go into your world, into your situation, whatever it is, thinking of yourself as, as an ambassador for Christ. Because that's what each and every one of you are. That's what each and every one of us, that's what each and every one of us are called for. 
I am an ambassador, Christ's ambassador. I am the strategy. Paul had to have his mind changed too. Prior to this, he thought of everyone from a human point of view, but then he writes up there in verse 16, from now on, therefore, from now on, we regard no one like that. He had to have his mind changed. Allow your mind to be changed as well. Because when you walk into your kitchen table uh, the morning after that fight with your wife, or the day when your kids are just getting on your nerves, if you walk into your kitchen table thinking of yourself as a missionary, as an ambassador through whom Christ, God, is making his appeal, you're going to have that interaction very differently. If you go to your lunch table and you sit down with the kid who's been mean to you or who you have an opportunity to really just get, and if you walk in there, I am a missionary whom God is making his appeal through, you are going to have that interaction differently. If you sit down at the conference table and you have a chance to turn the screws on your boss or on your coworkers or the people who work under you, if you go into that interaction remembering, I am an ambassador through whom God is making his appeal to these people, you are going to live and act and do things differently. Next week, we're going to talk about what that looks like, what that can look like, what that means, boots on the ground. This week, my challenge for you is simply to remember, you are a missionary. You are the strategy. God is making his appeal through you. Let that very humbling thought uh, sit with you over the course of this week. God is making an appeal to the world out there that is broken, that's lost, that's post-Christian, the world that God loves. God is making an appeal to that world, and he's doing it through you. Will you accept that calling? Will you accept that identity? Um, and, and then simply do who you are. Let's pray. God, we thank you for the way that your word speaks to us, like it did to me out of 1 John a few weeks ago. We thank you that your word is living and that you remind us in all sorts of ways um, of who we are. God, we don't know why your strategy is to, is to work through us. Sometimes it puzzles us because we're not very good at it and we fail constantly, but it, we are still your strategy. And so we ask you, God, that you would help us um, to live as your ambassadors day after day. For that, we don't, it's not just us trying harder. That's not going to work. We need your spirit to do it in us. And so we pray, God, that you would transform us by the power of your spirit, that you would transform our hearts and our minds um, to see people differently, not from our own point of view, but from your point of view, from the point of view um, of the cross. Help us to see differently like that. Transform our hearts to feel differently, to beat with a kind of compassion that's in line with your compassion, God. Lord, transform our bodies so that we can put um, your love into, into action, and not just in words and not just in speech. God, we pray that you would transform us so that we are filled with your spirit as we go out into this world to share this news that really is the very best news that the world needs to hear. We thank you that your grace is so far beyond um, how gracious we are. We thank you, God, that your, um, that your love extends beyond the borders of this room, and that it actually has spilled over into the world, into all of the world, into the ends of the earth, as you said. We pray, Lord, now that you would send us... Um, as your missionaries, as your ambassadors into this world to share this good news. We thank you, Jesus, for your love and for your graciousness with us. In your name we pray. Amen.